Richard Lepaitis, a war correspondent. I'm going back 20 years to a story that has haunted me all this time. It might have no end. Just as good and evil have no end. Life or death. Justice or denial. It's between Askaran and Agdan. This is my uncle. The old man. This is Zakaria's wife. It's my brother Zakaria's wife. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. I wasn't just a traveler. I was always seeking out something different. Each journey was a marvelous adventure. When I cycled from Lithuania to Yerevan, through all the towns destroyed by the earthquake, I told them that I was planning to travel through Nagorno-Karabakh. The fighting hadn't yet flared up. I wanted to go through the Azerbaijani mountains and ride across the country. They told me, don't risk it, they'll kill you in those mountains. It was in Yerevan that I first heard that I could be killed by Azerbaijanis. Richard cancelled his trip and returned by Moscow home to Lithuania. But a couple of years later, he decided after all to travel to Azerbaijan. He couldn't get the Armenians' words out of his head. Danger can be very attractive. He booked his ticket. When he arrived in Baku, he realized that there really was a war on. He took the night train to Agdam, a town close to Nagorno-Karabakh. I didn't know that I would arrive on the day that the whole country found out about the Hojeli tragedy. I didn't know there had been a massacre. What I saw over the following days changed my life completely, my understanding of humanity. I was later to call it the trip to hell. In Azerbaijan and Armenia today, everyone knows that the Karabakh movement was incited from the Kremlin. What started as an environmental movement in Armenia 
was transformed into the Karabakh movement. Suddenly, the slogans, Karabakh is ours, and Miyatsum, which means unification, were everywhere. In a matter of hours, cells of the Karabakh movement were created in Armenia. Only the KGB had the resources to do this. The Karabakh movement acquired almost holy status, and the people began to trust this committee unconditionally. It was at this time that members of the movement were arrested. I describe these arrests as a business trip to two notorious KGB jails in Moscow. After six months of brainwashing and propaganda, during which the members of the Karabakh movement were practically venerated as holy martyrs, the slogans surreptitiously changed. The Armenian president, Levon Tier Petrosyan's call to be good neighbors was changed to fight on to victory. Karabakh is ours. Karabakh. In 1988, when the Karabakh movement began, I knew about it a couple of months before I read about it in the newspapers. I took my family, my wife and children, and we flew to what was a completely new place for me, somewhere I'd never been, Karabakh. Karabakh is a unique Azerbaijani cultural island where the most well-renowned Mugam music talents were nurtured. At the beginning of the 19th century, the first opera and operetta in the Muslim East were written on the basis of Mugam, one of the most important pillars of Azerbaijani culture. For centuries, the land of Karabakh was famous for its tolerance, and both Muslims and followers of the local Albanian Christian church enjoyed peaceful coexistence, as they did across the rest of Azerbaijan, where a sizable Jewish community also enjoyed good relations. After the annexation of the Karabakh Khanate to Russia, more than 100,000 Armenians were resettled from Iran and Turkey to Azerbaijan and mainly to Karabakh, where they felt safe for the next 100 years. Clashes between the Azerbaijani and Armenian population began early in the 20th century, and in 1918, Armenians and Bolsheviks massacred the civilian population of Baku. The Azerbaijan Democratic Republic was, from 1918 to 1920, the first democratic republic in the Muslim East, and it included Nagorno-Karabakh, as was recognized by the British commander of the Allied troops on site. Despite this, in 1923, the Soviet Union granted autonomous status to the mountainous part of Karabakh within the borders of the newly created Soviet Azerbaijan. The region's borders were drawn to include villages with majority populations of Armenians and to exclude as many Azerbaijani villages as possible. This resulted in an Armenian majority. In a show of sinister symbolism, the provincial capital to the new autonomy was named Stepanakert after Armenian commissar Stepan Shomian mastermind of the 1918 Baku massacre. Some 70 years later, in the early 1990s, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, Azerbaijan and Armenia regained their independence, no longer restrained by the limitations of membership of a common union, and expansionist ambitions re-emerged. At first I had serious doubts, and I say it openly, about the intellectual capacity of my nation. We had been slaughtered, and people responded by flocking to the memorial to the genocide in Ottoman Turkey, laying flowers and lighting candles. That was when, and I don't hide it, I decided that we should start to respond properly. Every nation, without exception, has to fight to come into being or is revived through fighting. A nation is born through the pain of vast lands and numbers of people. Our nation was revived. 
We organized self-defense groups in the villages, collected weapons and distributed them to our fighters. After my arrival in Agdam, I saw a horrible scene. Hundreds of corpses were brought into the city. More and more refugees were arriving. As Richard walked into the Agdam hospital, he found a young man in a horrible state. Married only a month before, he'd been taken prisoner by the Armenians and released in exchange for two cans of petrol. His mother saw Richard's camera and took him for a foreign journalist. She gave me a photo and said, young man, go home and tell them what you've seen here. I realized that her dying son reflected the fate of the town destroyed on that night. This was the start of my journey, to find and tell the truth. Then I heard his name for the first time, Valet. Richard has been writing about the survivors of the Hojeli tragedy for 20 years. Now he learns that the young man he saw in the Agdam hospital, the one held prisoner by the Armenians, tortured half to death and swapped for a few cans of gasoline, had survived. Had you always lived in Hojali? Yes, I was born there, I went to school there, and I got married there. Russians and other ethnic groups lived there as well. We never thought of them as Russians or Armenians, we were just friends. And we got on well. Look, this is Lithuania. I had a long journey to Azerbaijan. Now, can you show me your house? Valek's new home and his grandfather's house were right next to the airport. In early 1992, before the attack on Hojali, the Armenian forces occupied its surrounding villages, 
and drove out the Azerbaijani population. By 1992, Hojali had become the second most populated town in the region, home to about 6,000 people, Azerbaijanis and Meskitian Turks. Besides having the only airport in the region, Hojali itself stood as a symbol of asylum to Azerbaijanis expelled from other places in Karabakh. The previous October, Armenian forces had cut the Khojali Agdam road connecting the town with mainland Azerbaijan. The only way to reach it now was by helicopter. The town had also been without electricity and gas for several months. The Armenian assault began on the night of the 25th of February. Armored vehicles from the 366th Regiment surrounded Khojali before the Armenian fighters went in and overwhelmed the local defenders. Their only possible escape route involved a dangerous journey across a river and through forested mountains. Late in the evening on the 25th of February, I was at home when heavy shelling began from all sides. I went to the window and saw the big apple tree in my grandfather's yard split in two by a shell. I realized that the Armenians were already very close. I got my wife and we ran. Outside we saw our neighbors running to escape the attacks of machine guns and artillery. Then tanks came. Whenever they saw a crowd, they opened fire. The people panicked. Women, children, the elderly. Everyone was sucked into the chaos. There was never any question for me, then or now, that we had to liberate Khojale from those gangs. We provided a corridor through which they could get out safely and told them so many times. I was the first person to tell them about this on television. I said, we will clear Khojale of bandit groups and suggested that the civilian population buy the hide in suitable places or leave what will inevitably be a combat zone through this corridor. The corridor will be safe. However, the human rights group Helsinki Watch have confirmed that no survivors were aware of any safe corridor. And without power, a televised warning seems implausible. There was only one escape route, and this was under attack from all sides. We went down here and crossed the river. Valak helped his group of 50 across the river before finally wading in himself his wife on his shoulders. As he lifted her down on the far bank, he slipped, exhausted, back into the water. Now, soaked to the skin, he, his wife, and their group moved off in a long chain, skirting the mountains towards safety. After more than 13 kilometers, cold and exhausted, as they crossed a valley outside Askaran, they came under fire from all sides. It was open country and impossible to escape. Around 500 people lost their lives. It was here, near the castle, just outside Askaran. I heard things that I couldn't even imagine. They told me that hundreds of them were massacred. I couldn't believe it. I thought it was an exaggeration. But they were describing the details. People told me how they fled, how they crossed a big river. It was the 25th of February, minus 12 degrees centigrade. There were a lot of witnesses, so I hardly had room to write down their testimonies in my diary. In the first line with the Russian soldiers from the 366th Regiment, they were wearing their body armor and flak jackets. And after them came the Armenian gangsters. 
We couldn't stay any longer and had to leave the battleground. But they built an ambush and were waiting for us. All our civilians, children, women, old people were massacred. Besides, the whole 366th Motorized Infantry Battalion belonging to the Soviet Army was appropriated by the Armenians. They had collected so many forces, what could Kocali do against this power? It was impossible to hear anything because of the thunder of the guns, and the houses, one by one, were exploding. This was a settlement, so naturally, besides houses, there were haystacks, various wood constructions, etc. They were burning. The sky turned red. The operation was planned by Colonel, now Major General, Arkady Ivanovich Tadavasyan, according to all the rules of war. We even invited architects who made a model of Khojale. Our guys used this model to prepare the attack and decide which units would attack the town and from where. Yes, I devised and commanded the operation. If you surround the enemy, they will put up fierce resistance. You have to leave a road for them to get out. When we attacked a village or district in order to destroy those illegal armed gangs, we realized that the easier and safer it is for the population to leave, the fewer losses we will have. You see, this whole situation is down to politicians. It was what they did that brought about the situation. We didn't play the main role. We're dispensable, we kill them, they kill us. We die, they die. A politician's goal is to show the whole world how important they are. That's why they need a lot of blood, a lot of blood, a meat grinder to show what an important role they play. We were under heavy fire from all sides. Bullets were whistling overhead. My wife was walking behind me, and suddenly I heard her cry out. I turned and asked, what's wrong? Nothing, she said, shaking her head. I put my hand on her side to help her move further and felt something warm on my hand. I saw her blood. I froze, and she did not say anything more. Several people came up who were behind us. Some of them said, let's go, don't waste your time, she's dead. I said, either I go with her, or I stay here and die with her. soldiers on their way to secure Garagaya. But there were hundreds of others, less fortunate. We were going. Suddenly, they shot my mother. I ran to her and saw that she wasn't moving. My father came close to me and lifted me. He said, stand up, let's go. I said, no, I can't leave my mum here. He said, 
We have to, because Armenians may catch us. I was just eight years old. I didn't understand what it meant to die. We ran a little and suddenly realized that Armenians had surrounded us. I held my sister's hand. They told us that males should be separated from females. And I took my sister and stood aside. They directed the guns to us. They shot my sister. She was two years younger than me. She released my hand and fell down, and we left her there as well. Armenians took us to Azkaran. They captured us. Valech and the other refugees were taken to Azkaran and thrown in the basement of the local police prison. Bale was badly tortured. He couldn't move and looked like he was dead. His face was really bruised and swollen. He couldn't even open his mouth. An Armenian said to him, you play Karabakh music on your guitar, we'll get you for that. And he pressed his hands onto a hot stove, burning his fingers. His legs were hurt his mouth torn open, and he couldn't speak. He didn't look human. Vale was in a really bad way. Worse than me, even though I thought things couldn't be any worse. During his torturous weeks in captivity, Vale clung to the hope that Azerbaijani soldiers would have saved the others at Garagaya, and that his wife's body had been attended to. Azerbaijanis then Azerbaijan declared its independence and refused to host any Russian military bases on its territory, which is adjacent to Iran and Turkey. Of course, this undermined Russia's strategic position. Around 50 of the 350 or so remaining soldiers of the 366th Regiment were Armenian, including the commander of its 2nd Battalion, Major Siran Ohanian. For the Karabakh Armenians, the regiment and its large stores of weaponry were a godsend. Russia, as one of the sides, should take responsibility for what happened in Hojali. The 366th Regiment played the main role in Hojali, unfortunately. The 366th Regiment was stationed in Stepanakert, and some Armenian officers joined us. One of them is now a commander of Karabakh forces, another is Chechen Valeri, and another was recently the Minister of Defense of Armenia. They were with me at the time. Moreover, it was a Russian, not a Soviet USSR regiment. All the soldiers were drunk after Army Day on 23rd of February. There's a lot of evidence of that. It was basically a gang that was used by the Armenians who were the leaders at the time and are now ruling the country by the current president, Serge Sarkisyan, and current defense minister, Seran Ohanian, who was then a major. This article entitled The Glorious Victory of Armenian Weapons, The Truth About Khojali, was written by Levon Melikshak Nazarian, a leader of the Armenian Karabakh secessionist movement. In the article, he shows an Armenian map named Plan for the Liberation of Khojali. It indicates the fourth zone of attack on the airport with heavy armament. It inadvertently shows a note on the map, Zhenya, referring to Yevgeny Nabokik, then commander of the 3rd Battalion of the 366th Regiment. 
Russia is involved too in this tragedy of the Azeri nation, and this is regrettable. That's why the repentance of Russia is very important, especially of the former Russian leadership. However, there are no longer leaders. Boris Nikolaevich Yeltsin, who personally decided the fate of the 366th Regiment, Marshal Shaposhnikov, who was the head of the Russian and Commonwealth forces, and in fact, this regiment was under his command. It is remarkable that indifference smothers everything. The evidence of journalists, including Victoria Ivlova, who was in the second wave of the assault, throws up some very interesting stories. Victoria Ivlova made that slogan, Only the dead are left in Hojeli, the headline of her article in Moscow News. You better tell me the whole story about how you found this woman. Well, the chain was very interesting. When you sent me the picture of the woman and the idea of looking for her, we looked all over. But I soon realized that it was pointless to look via official channels. I had to do it myself, using private contacts. Some looked and said yes, some said no. But it was obvious that they weren't sure. It was my toughest research in 25 years as a journalist. There was one more reason, another obstacle that made it difficult. Women from Khojali try to hide the fact that they were held prisoner. They don't even go to testify. Their husbands do that instead. Why do they hide that they were prisoners? Because of rape. I sent a photo to someone in Sabirabad, and at last I got a reply. Someone recognized her, but said that she lives in another village gave me the name and so on. I said, go and check it out right away. And later he called back and said, yes, it's her. Would you like to see what she looks like now? Right now? Yes, I would. I've blown up the photo. Compare the two. Compare. I think it's her. Looks very similar. Hello. Do you remember me? same. You don't speak Russian? Where is the girl? Where is she? When you found her, she was only two days old. 
She's ill and she cannot speak. Does she understand us? No, she doesn't. It doesn't matter. What's her name? Gunai. Junai. Gunai. Gunai. Even if she doesn't understand, please tell her that I carried her in my arms when she was just one day old. Do you remember how the attack began? We were being shelled every day. When the Armenians began firing, we hid in basements and spent hours there. My daughter was born in a basement on the 23rd of February among men and women. I didn't leave the basement until late in the evening of the 25th of February, not until the Armenian assault began. How were you taken prisoner? They took us from the basement. That's me there. Look, here you are in the picture. How did the Armenians allow you to take these photos? I was with the Armenians, remember? When we moved off and I was carrying your daughter, a soldier rode up on his horse and hit me with the butt of his rifle. They thought that I was a prisoner too. My one-day-old baby fell out of my hands and you found her. I remember you brought me the girl and returned her to me in this place. There she is in that picture with a blanket. It's the same blanket on the other picture. That's where you handed her over to me. OK, now ask her if she remembers that we wondered where to hide the money so that it wasn't taken. In our boots or our bras? Yes, yes, she told me herself, hide it there. Where did you put it? In your bra? Where? Underwear? Ask her. It's impolite. It's polite, don't worry. Where did you hide the money? I hid it there. <laughs> it's all over. They were hard times and I don't want to go through it all again. No, I only want one thing, for this girl to get well. The men who sacrifice their lives to protect their families, not knowing that their women and children had been ambushed and murdered, actually died in vain. It affected Richard in ways he didn't expect. His thoughts turned to questions of right and wrong. When he began his journey, Richard was concerned with giving a voice to the survivors, the people who'd lost everything, children, parents, home, and the human right to live in peace with dignity. But the more he met and listened to people on both sides, the more he felt they were moving through an endless corridor. 
both those who killed and those who had been killed. Why they were killed and by whom are the main questions for me personally. I'm pretty sure, but it is impossible to prove it, that all these people were killed by mistake. They were scared and shot them at night. They were trying to protect their own people. They thought they were Armenians and shot them. You think they will confess that they did it themselves? Of course they will say it was us. Their argument contrasts with what I've heard from survivors. Archive footage shows people were shot in cold blood. It gives the opposite answer to the question, who did it? When the Armenian-controlled corridor from Khojali was closed to foreign media, there was only one journalist, an Azerbaijani, who was allowed through to film in the territory controlled by the Armenians. Hello. How are you? At the time, Richard had wondered why he got this access. And now, he had the chance to ask him directly. I was a military cameraman at that time. Early in the morning of 26th February, when I went to the office, my boss told me about the tragedy in Hojali. We had military helicopters. We scrambled a helicopter, and by 2 p.m. we had reached Agdam. The bodies of the dead were being brought in by the dozen. After the Hojili massacre, we couldn't collect all the dead. Nobody knew how many there were and where they were. Those who had escaped talked about hundreds of victims. There were many corpses, especially near Askaran, controlled by Armenians. We had a deal with the Armenians to exchange bodies. But now there were so many dead civilians that the Armenians couldn't deal with them or didn't want to. This was the largest number of victims in the whole Karabakh war. Our local field commander in Agdam, Alaverdi Bagirov, knew the Armenian commander in Askaran, Vitali Balasanyan. They had played together on the Karabakh soccer team back in the Soviet days. I went to see Alaverdi, who was discussing with Vitali about collecting corpses near Askaran. Vitali didn't want me to go there, but then he checked it with Stepanakart and agreed. However, he had some conditions. Foreign journalists could not film him or his soldiers. Then Alaverdi and I left together. Was there an Armenian post there? There was. We sat in Armenian cars and headed for Askaran. Passing the post between Agdam and Askaran. We were with the Armenian military. When we reached Askaran, it was a horrible scene. Many corpses had been mutilated. Vitali and his fighters were next to me the whole time. Telling me, film this, but not this. But I didn't switch off my camera. I held it down at my side and kept recording. Oh, God. Do not forgive this. My motherland. Oh, a scary land. Whenever I could, I lifted up my camera and filmed all round. I managed to record Vitali himself at the site where it happened. So are you sure the territory was under Armenian control? Of course. Why else would the Armenian commander Vitali Balasanyan have been there? 
I didn't know that on the other side of the front line in Askaran and Khojali, Atura Zukas, a Lithuanian journalist, had interviewed Armenian commanders. What's your opinion, your first impression about yesterday's events? Yesterday, the town... Stop filming. At the same time, the new masters were settling in to devastated Khojali. They threw innocent people out on the street and confiscated their homes. As I listened to Seydaga, I still didn't understand why they let an Azerbaijani cameraman film the crime scene. I think they wanted the Azerbaijani people to be in shock, to be afraid. Years later, British journalist Thomas de Waal came to the same conclusion. He quotes the current president of Armenia, Serge Sekisyan, who was then a military commander, on the reasons for the Kojali massacre. I think the main point is something different. Before Kojali, the Azerbaijanis thought that they were joking with us. They thought that the Armenians were people who could not raise their hand against the civilian population. We were able to break that stereotype. And that's what happened. I want to repeat again, and not in order to justify myself. We had no intention of fighting civilians, especially not corpses. Where is the logic? What is there to talk about? The mere fact that there is a strict taboo on the topic of Khojali in Armenia makes me think that it was a crime against humanity. The people who committed those crimes in Hojali will stand before a court. I am sure that it will happen in our lifetime. I hope that the Armenians will overcome their fears. The woman our soldiers are carrying is my wife. Say her dead.
sky.